Good morning, and welcome to First Baptist Church of Sparks online worship service. I'm Lori Stevens, the church administrator, and we're glad that you're here today. The sermon is entitled, All Doubting is Not Bad, from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. It has to do with one of the apostles doubting Thomas, and now his doubt actually led him to a stronger faith in Christ. His doubt led to the place where he proclaimed to Jesus, my Lord and my God. So when you struggle with doubt, don't think you are weird or some sort of loser Christian or your salvation is in jeopardy. All we have to do is look at the life of Doubting Thomas and where it led him. And as always, please share these videos with your family and friends and hit the subscribe button and the like button. Thank you. Good morning. Take your Bibles, the Word of God, and turn to John chapter 20, verses 19 to 23. I've entitled a sermon, All Doubt is Not Bad. This morning I want to tackle the subject of doubt or a struggle to believe in Christ. I'm mainly talking to Christians. We all have made mistakes in life. But how sad it would be if you were known all your life for one mistake you made or one moment of weakness in your life. Thomas was one of the original 12 disciples. He was a faithful follower of Christ. We find quotations of Thomas throughout the Gospels. When Jesus was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, he was warned by his disciples that the Jews wanted to stone him. And then Thomas interpreted Jesus going to be with a dead Lazarus as part of a plan to restore his kingdom. This man, the zealous Thomas, said in John eleven sixteen, let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas believed in Jesus as the Messiah to the extent of martyrdom. He was willing to die with him. So here Thomas was not a disciple who was lukewarm or skeptical. He had a close relationship with Jesus and would follow Jesus to the end. Later in Thomas's life, according to tradition, Thomas spread the gospel in Parthia and Persia when he died. Later, tradition places Thomas in India, where he was martyred. The Martoma Church in India traces its origins to Thomas. So, with all this devotion Thomas showed to Jesus, to get stuck with one of the worst nicknames, Doubting Thomas, outside of being called a Judas, is a shame. This passage takes place after the resurrection. This is a tense, fearful, and confusing time for the disciples. Remember, here is what they expected. They expected Jesus would sit on the throne, put Israel on top, that he would kick the Romans out on their ear. These men were with Jesus from the beginning. These men saw and participated in all the miracles, the teachings, and healings, and some even saw the transfiguration. But here they are just hours after Mary told them Jesus was alive, sitting behind locked doors, fearful of being rounded up and possibly crucified as Jesus was. But something unexpected is about to happen to these men. Thomas is called Doubting Thomas. When we think of someone who doubts, we tend to believe that person is far away from the Lord. But that's not always the case. Here's a key thought. Just like Thomas, our doubts can be transformed by Jesus into faith. As we go through this passage today, we will see how Jesus will deal with this man struggling with doubt. Look there at John chapter 20, verses 19 through 23. Remember, Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, commemorates the creation of the world. But Sunday, the first day of the week, commemorates the redemption of the world. Fearful and confused, the disciples met in secret. Christ appears to them, apparently coming through the wall. To the troubled disciples, Christ brings a message of peace. Several important concepts come out of this action. Jesus had a real body. His body had been resurrected, not just his spirit. And the nail prints proved that he was Jesus, not someone else. The resurrection had certain implications for the disciples. And it gave them peace. 
And, it, and Jesus implied a commission he had for them. He said, so send I you. This passage says that Jesus breathed on them. This gift of the Holy Spirit is connected with the action of forgiving them or retaining sins. It was not the work of the disciples to forgive sin, but the work of the Holy Spirit through the disciples as they preached and fulfilled the Great Commission. Christ gave the disciples authority to state that forgiveness of sin was possible. So look there at our passage. When it was evening on the first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. I cannot imagine the level of anxiety the disciples were feeling at this point. All their hopes and dreams were shattered on the cross on Friday. There had, they had been given some glimmers of hope. Mary's report and Peter and John's examination of the empty tomb. But for some reason, even after all the times Jesus told the disciples what was going to happen, they were still disappointed. They still doubted. They were anxious, confused, and afraid. Let me ask you, have you ever had your world shattered? Your hopes and dreams crushed? This is the context of what the disciples are dealing with. The disciples' expectation of a Messiah were not, to, were not going to be met by a dead Messiah. For sure, Jesus told them many times he would rise again. They wanted to believe that. But people who are crucified and have a spear jammed into their ribcage do not resurrect. When they saw Jesus raise Lazarus, maybe that did not register to them because Lazarus was not publicly executed. Who knows? But when your expectations are not met, not much will pull you out of those doubts. These disciples were struggling to believe what Jesus told them. They probably wanted to believe, but the spectacle of seeing Jesus suffering on the cross and dying was too much for their faith and belief to overcome. Now let me ask you, at what point do you not believe in the promises of Christ? Now listen, for his disciples, this is where the rubber meets the road. Jesus told them he would rise again. Their eyes and life experience would not let them believe that. What promises or biblical stories will your eyes and ears and life experience not allow you to believe? For the disciples, it was the resurrected Christ. You know, I've met many Christians like the disciples. When Noah in the ark or Jonah in the whale caused them not to believe, they could not accept those events. But here's the thing, it never stops there. In verse 20, Jesus enters the building. Think about this for a moment. Jesus enters through a locked door. And he's standing in the middle of his disciples. The ones who are supposed to carry out his mission. And they are fearful. They are scared. And the first thing Jesus says to this group of doubters was peace be with you. You know, if I had been Jesus, I probably would have said grow a spine. Have a little faith. Trust me. But despite this display of faithlessness, Jesus does not chastise them. He invites them. John 20, 20. Having said this, Jesus showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. This was a moment to remember. Now Jesus had their attention. 
These disciples did not need to be rejected or chastised or demoralized for their struggling faith. They needed encouragement. Once Jesus had their attention, they were now ready to carry out what Jesus wanted them to do. Now nothing would stop them, least of all fear of what would be done to them. And Jesus gives them a threefold calling. First, in verse 21, Jesus is now sending them to do the work. The word send is the word we translate as apostle, meaning sent one, or one who is sent. Second, in verse 22, Jesus empowers the disciples. Jesus gives the new apostles resources, resources that they need to function effectively. He gives them the Holy Spirit. In this gift, they not only have the comfort of a heavenly advocate in their lives, but they have true peace in their heart. That word breathed is the same word in Hebrew used in Genesis to translate the word speaking of God breathing the breath of life into Adam. Third, in verse 23, Jesus gives them authority. This time with Jesus will be a, a moment to remember. There's one problem. Someone is missing. Look at verse 24 and 25. Now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Thomas said to them, Unless I see his hands in the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now listen. In life, there are things that you remember. Sometimes they are so incredible that you can't even get them out of your mind. When Thomas comes back, he cannot believe what he is hearing. Thomas wasn't there for that great event. He did not see Jesus. He did not get to hear Jesus. He did not get to touch Jesus. And now he is experiencing something that logic tells him cannot believe. It would be kind of like hearing a fish story or some story that you would see deem too incredible that would be too hard to believe. Thomas was not involved in the moment to remember. And the moment was so incredible, he could not believe it. What questions would you ask if you heard something too incredible, so incredible, but you wanted to believe it, but reality wouldn't let you believe it? We could pick on Thomas because he's the one we call Doubting Thomas. But how many of us would have Doubting for our first name if we walked into that scene? Remember, Jesus dying shattered their hopes, crushed their dreams. Then suddenly Tom, Thomas walks in and hears all this crazy talk about Jesus being alive. When Thomas knew when someone was put on a cross, you didn't come off the cross alive. That fact, in part, was true. Jesus did not come off the cross alive. Instead, he arose on the third day and defeated death on the third day. But this is something Thomas should have expected because Jesus told them several times it was going to happen. Plus, Thomas saw the resurrection of Lazarus. But sometimes, no matter what your eyes have seen, and no matter how many facts you have before you, some things are hard to believe. After the death and resurrection of Jesus, Thomas would not believe the other disciples who were reporting seeing the risen Lord. He says in verse 20, 25, unless I see his hands in the mark of nails and place my fingers in the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Given what we know, I don't think Thomas's response is out of line. I really don't think so. Now Thomas gets to hear the stories. Maybe he gets needled for not believing for the rest of the week. But here's the rest of the story. Look there at verse 26. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, 
Reach your finger here and look at my hands. And reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. This was a week later. Thomas gets his moment to remember finally, which leads to his moment to believe. A week later, the disciples were still meeting behind locked doors. Eight days to be exact. Maybe the disciples were processing the events of the previous week. Here Jesus enters the room again with the same greeting as last time. But this time, guess who's in the room? And the Bible says Jesus looks at Thomas, the one who openly doubted Jesus. And Jesus did not obliterate him, run him down, or reject him. Here's my point. Why should we be fearful if we are struggling with doubt, like Thomas did? Jesus provided evidence for Thomas so he could believe. Why should we not do the same for those struggling with doubts? When Jesus met Thomas, he said in verse 27, Put your finger here and see my hands. Put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Then Thomas proclaimed in verse 28, My Lord and my God. Jesus made a point to see Thomas. And he did that to show the doubtful disciple that he really was the Messiah. Notice Thomas, when presented with the evidence, was happy to believe. Doubt does not always indicate someone is miles and miles away from the Lord. One commentator said, The reflective Christian is one who answers what he or she believes while continuing to believe what he or she is questioning. I like that. I can personally identify with that. But I want you to know, it's also good for Christians to allow their doubts to be challenged by God's truth and God's faithfulness. Some Christians might see our struggles and doubts as evidence we are far away from God. But these struggles and doubts might show us how close we are to Him. I've not made it a habit to criticize Christians who have honest doubts. I know many great men and women of God have had doubts, but it's what they did with their doubts that makes them great. They let those doubts be challenged by God's truth and faithfulness, by the Word of God. So when you struggle with doubt, don't think you are some weird or some lesser Christian or your salvation is in jeopardy. Jesus is big enough to deal with your doubts, and he's big enough to help you through them. And your church family can help you in this area. Give me an office visit. You know, I, love not, I would love nothing more than to answer your doubts as best I can. It might open your eyes if you are being open and honest. And of course, accepting Christ is a major thing to do in overcoming your doubt as a lost person. And I want to give you that opportunity this morning. Would you pray this prayer with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner. I ask Jesus to forgive me for all my sins and take me to heaven when I die. In Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord bless you. Hope to see you next week at the same time with another sermon. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me.